So yeah, an introduction to the biomolecular simulation. So first of all, why would we bother? Why would we want to do biomolecular simulation? Uh, because of this, wriggling and jiggling. Uh, apparently originally coined by Richard Feynman many years ago. That sort of picture on the right you can see is uh, from a biomolecular simulation. It's a small kinase domain of a anti-cancer -can target uh, complexed with a, an anti-tumor drug. And as you can see, everything is jiggling around. And that is that is thermal motion. That is just due to the fact that this system exists at room or body temperature. Everything is always jiggling around if it's got if it's at anything above absolute zero. For macroscopic objects, you can't see it because the size of those vibrations, those movements, are really, really small compared to the size of objects. But when you get down to the atomistic scale, the, the if you like, the amplitude of those vibrations, those motions, is actually of the same size as the objects we're dealing with. In other words, these are really significant motions, and this is happening all the time. Or every single protein, nucleic acid, everything in our body is constantly being battered around and is jiggling around like this, whether or not we're actually we like deliberately interfering with it. So at the moment, there's no way that we can see this type of motion by, if you like, a non-computational experimental technique. And I must admit, I don't like the way that people say that computation is not experiment. It is an experimental technique. Believe me, you do lots and lots of experiments just the way you do if you're in a wet lab. So I don't like this idea of calling it like experiment or simulation. Simulations are experiments. But the point is, is that computational methods are really the only ones we have to kind of get this view. And it's due to this, really, that, again, quite a few years ago, computational simulations become known as the computational microscope. That was, a, I think, first coined by Klaus Schulten, who's the guy behind some of the earliest um, molecular dynamic simulation programs. And these, it's pointing out that these motions, if you like, are too small to be seen normally. It gives that microscope idea. But the bit that it doesn't also point out is that they're not only just too small to see directly by any microscopic method, they're too fast to be able to be appreciated by any atomistic method. In fact, the amount by which this picture, if you like, is scaled up compared to the real molecule is actually less than the amount that time has been slowed down to show this picture. That's how fast these things happen. So really, even if we did have a microscope that could see things this small, we still wouldn't be able to appreciate these motions because they happen too fast. So at the moment, the only methodology we've got to look at this is computational simulations. And most of the ones that we use, the ones we're going to be talking about here, certainly today, are basically using some approximations to the laws of physics, to try and give us a handle on what must be going on at this atomistic scale at these incredibly short time scales and fast motions. So if you want a, a nice introduction to molecular dynamic simulation, understand all the different things that you can do with molecular dynamic simulations, then I thoroughly recommend this review. It's a couple of years old now, but it doesn't, hasn't changed anything from Scott Hollingsworth and Ron Dror, Stanford. To neuron, uh, and it gives you a nice sort of overview of all the different things that you can do with molecular dynamic simulations, and why you might want to one think of apply, applying it to your particular problem. But rather than go through everything that's in that paper, I'd just have, to have my take on why you might want to do molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, there are many reasons people do molecular dynamic simulations, but in some senses, they fall into two broad camps. And the first thing they do them in the hope that they'll see something amazing happening. So, you know, sorts of things we're talking about, 
seeing how proteins fold, maybe. Or maybe seeing the pathways through which ligands somehow percolate deep into the central cavities in proteins and find their binding sites. Or maybe to see how molecules pass through channels in membranes from one side to the other and how some molecules get through and some don't. So these are all simulations where we're trying to understand something really, some big change that's going on. So the second set of reasons why people do MD, strange enough, is in the hope that nothing amazing will happen at all. This may sound a bit weird, but what we're talking about here actually is the use of molecular dynamic simulations to predict thermodynamic quantities. So for example, very importantly in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the binding affinities of ligands to proteins. So a large amount of computer power is being burnt up around the world on both academic and commercial supercomputers, basically trying to solve that problem on the right hand side. That's a really important problem, one we still can't do as well as we would like to. But most of the methods that are being developed to try and do this, the best ones, in one form or other use molecular dynamic simulations to do it. And I just, there's some things in there that I wanted to bring out just to explain if you like why on earth you'd want to do a simulation where nothing much happens or you hope nothing much happens. So, as you probably already realize by now, ultimately a molecular dynamic simulation ends up being a kind of movie. You get a whole series of frames and we often use that, te that, those, that terminology in fact, each of which is a moment in time, a snapshot of what our particular biomolecule looked like at that moment. So what's interesting about that time series of shapes of our molecule is that it can be shown that that's really equivalent to looking at a whole collection of molecules at one moment in time. In other words, for example, any statistics that you might get from analyzing that time series ought to be equivalent or could be equivalent to the statistics you would get from averaging over all the molecules in a sample. And of course, this is what you do in the wet lab. This is what you do in the dry computer lab. And it's this is the way that you connect the two things together. Because in general, when we're in the wet lab, we are not looking at things one molecule at a time. Sometimes we are but mostly we're not. And certainly when we're trying to calculate thermodynamic quantities, we're always talking about quantities associated with, you know, Avogadro's numbers of molecules or something of that order anyway. And this is the way that you are connecting these two things together. And to get a bit more specific, and again, to bring it to thermodynamics, for those who can remember their statistical thermodynamics, everything comes ultimately from knowing the partition function. So if you remember that, Z or Z for some of you in the audience, is this sum, and this sum is over all the microstates that a, that a system can adopt. So these are basically microstates. These are all the different shapes that a system can be in. And in theory, to get the partition function, you've got to sum over every single possible microstate, weighting it by this factor here. And that EI is the energy of that microstate. So what's nice is you can see that in a molecular dynamic simulation, you generate, I, uh, you generate microstates. As it happens, you will know for each of those microstates what the energy is. So if you sum over enough of them, and that is the big, big, big issue, but if you can run this movie for long enough, then there's a chance that this sum will approach what it should be. And then you can get to thermodynamics, and then you can relate it to what you've been seeing in your wet lab experiment. But there's some important things here about the fact that 
Looking at a system over time can be equivalent to looking at a large number of molecules at an instant in time. And that actually we're always wanting to make this simulation longer and longer and longer to get better and better predictions as to what the true, for example, properties, particularly thermodynamic properties of the system are. And this is always going to be a challenge for reasons that hopefully will become a bit clearer. So if there's a motivation, just first bit, there are many good reasons to perform molecular dynamic simulations, but I wonder what will happen if I run molecular dynamics on this is not one of them. And I say that not entirely tongue in cheek, because I must admit that in my early days of doing it myself, I often fell into this trap. The, the trouble with molecular simulations, with a lot of computational techniques, is they're almost too easy to have a go at. You know, if you suddenly thought one day, oh, I wonder what happens if I go into my molecular biology lab and do this, that, or the other. The activation barrier to doing that is enormous. You've got to get all the right stuff, get along to the lab, pull your kit on, order your chemicals, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a lot of time before you get there when you could think, actually, you know what, I don't think I could be bothered to do this. Perhaps it's not such a good idea. Unfortunately, it's only too easy sometimes to, ooh, let's just quickly do this. Tippy tap tap on your computer once you're relatively proficient. And before you know it, you've started yourself a new molecular dynamics experiment without perhaps always thinking about why you were doing it. And one of the things I do want to stress is that just like any other branch of science, you don't want to start a computational experiment until you've got a good idea about why you're doing it and what you expect to get out the other end. But it's amazing how often, because they're, you know, they look nice and people want to see what happens. People start them sometimes without thinking really why it is they're doing it. So I don't want to put anybody off doing it. But I would say please think really about what it is that you're looking for when you start to do one. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how it all works. So a bit more physics again. What we know is that you've got an atom bit of mass, and it's got some, some velocity, there's nothing else around, then it will move in a straight line at a constant speed. However, if there's another atom around, if there's some form of interaction with that other atom, then that will mean there's a force acting on it, and if there's a force acting on it, then that will induce an acceleration in the atom. In other words, there'll be a change in either or both of its speed and direction. Okay, so we've seen a link here between where atoms are, where atoms are going, and forces. And that's exactly what's having to be calculated when you do a molecular dynamics simu simulation. It's a time series and it's an iterative process. So you're predicting how all those atoms in your system are going to change their positions as a function of time. In order to work out how they're moving over time, you've got to know what the forces acting on them are and how they change over time. So we're linking atoms positions and forces in order to iteratively generate this movie. So the basic kind of process of making a simulation is very much like the way that we create, you know, animations. Be it Wallace and Gromit or uh, uh, what's the latest one, uh, Toy Story or like, you know, anything like that. We know how it happens. In the old days, they were actually physical models, bits of plasticine or whatever it was, and you moved them a little bit, and you took a picture, and you moved them a little bit, and you took a picture, and you moved them a bit, and you took a picture, and it's the same thing, really, in a molecular dynamics simulation. You start off with all the molecules in their positions. You know what their velocities are. If you know what the positions are, then perhaps you can calculate what all the forces are that each atom is exerting on every other one. So if you know what all the forces are and what the current velocities are, you can work out where the atoms are a little moment later. 
and then you can move those atoms to those new positions. Now the atoms have all moved. Well, if the atoms have moved, then those forces have changed as well. Uh oh, well, back to one. Now in these new positions, calculate the new forces. With the new forces, work out where the atoms go, move the atoms. Now the forces have changed. Round and round and round you go. One very important thing, I see a small time later. Because these things are so small and move so fast, the time interval between which we have to calculate what those forces are is very, very small. It's of the order of one to two femtoseconds. So a femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And it's about the amount of time, I think, that light would take to travel from one end of a protein to the other. It is not a long period of time at all. But that's one of the issues with molecular dynamic simulations, is whereas where, when you're making an animated movie, you can get away with basically having one frame every, I don't know, approximately 10th of a second, 10 to the minus one seconds. When you're making a movie of a protein, you're making a frame every 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So you've got some real time scale issues there. So what we said is that this thing about calculating forces is going to be a really important thing for molecular dynamic simulation. So let's talk a little bit about that. So if we're going to do that, we need some kind of mathematics to help us do that. We need an equation that's going to basically relate the energy of a collection of atoms to their position. So x is all the positions of all the atoms, and u is some function which, when you give it the positions, tells you what the energy is. OK, so if that's the energy, then the forces are just the derivative of that, minus dux by dx. Simple. OK, yes, but these equations can be complex. But let's start simple. Let's take a really simple system. Here's carbon monoxide. Can't get much simpler than that. Two atoms, carbon and oxygen. And our mathematical model for this might just say, well, let's take the bond between them and assume it's, we'll model that as a harmonic spring. So the equation for the energy of a harmonic spring is this one here. The energy is equal to some force constant is about how stiff that bond is, whether it's an easily sort of deformable bond or one that's really very stiff, multiplied by the difference between R, which is the current distance between those two atoms, minus REQ, which is the equilibrium bond length, the ideal bond length when there would be no sort of stress in that spring, squared. So that's the equation for the energy in a, as we say, Hookean spring. Take the derivative of that, and that's the equation for the force. So if you want to do a molecular dynamic simulation on carbon monoxide, this is the only little equation you'd need to do, which would make life for your computer very nice and simple. But you can see even this, there's some numbers that you need to know. You need to know what this thing K is, as I said, is this force constant that tells you how strong the bond is. And you need to know this thing, REQ, which is basically the, the ideal length of the bond between those two atoms. So there are only two atoms, but there are two parameters which we must know for this equation before we can do any simulations. OK, let's scale things up a bit now. Let's go from carbon monoxide to a small protein system. OK, now things look a little bit more complicated. This is a relatively small protein, say just about 38,000 atoms. That would be a fairly typical one. You can see at the top, that's the equation you've seen before. You've seen that one. That was that harmonic spring. But notice now there's a sum. And in fact, there's lots and lots of sums through all of this thing. Because, of course, there isn't just one bond in the system. There's lots and lots of bonds. So we've got to add up the energy associated with every single bond. Then we've got to calculate the energy associated with every single angle in the system. 
Then we have a mathematical function that tells us the energy that's associated with dihedrals. This is the twisting around single bonds. And then these last two terms are ways of defining how the energy of the system changes according to non-bonded interactions. These are atoms which aren't connected by a, a covalent bond, but are just close to each other, maybe clashing into each other, or maybe they have a charge on them. Maybe one of them is slightly positively charged, one is slightly negatively charged, and so there's an electrostatic interaction between them. So this is a much more complicated set of equations, but you can see it's just basically a large number of sums or sums of sums. So it's all the sort of stuff that a computer can do perfectly straightforwardly. But you can see again, these little sort of yellowish boxes, there I've marked all the parameters. These are all the things that you would need to know before you could actually for real run a molecular dynamics simulation on this little protein. And actually, if you sum it up, you'll find that there's about 70,000 different parameters that you would have to know before you could run a simulation on this thing. But if you knew them, you can do it. So, basically, how does it work? They're iterative calculations. They produce a time series of atom positions and other properties of the system. At every time point, you don't just know where every atom is. You know the energy of the system. You might know some other things as well. You can work out the temperature of the system, or you can work out the pressure, maybe, of the system. Various other things as well. So it's not just positions that you get from doing a molecular dynamics simulation. But clearly, before you even begin to do this thing for real, you've got quite a lot of homework to do. In particular, you've got to know the values for a very large number of parameters which describe your particular system, and which will be different depending on exactly which protein, piece of DNA, lipid, glycan, sugar, whatever it might be that you are looking at. The calculations take a lot of computer power because you're having to do, as you can see, a lot of sums. You saw those, those equations. And you've got to solve that equation every single time step. Every single one to two femtosecond moment in time, you've got to re-evaluate all those equations, calculate new energies and new forces. So this is why, basically, you need, and you do use, a lot of computing power to generate these molecular dynamics simulations. And even with the best computers we've got at the moment, it's probably fair to say that you're really limited at the moment to studying systems of, in most cases, try to keep it below a million atoms. And you'll probably be lucky if you can do much more than a microsecond. Now, of course, both of those limits can be breached. But if we're just talking about ballpark figures for what you would be trying to do normally, you'd probably be talking about staying within that range. Now, a million atoms sounds like a lot. You think, well, that's a massive protein. But as you'll see in a moment, it's a little bit more complicated than that. OK, let's get on to some practicalities. If you're going to do some biomolecular simulation, some molecular dynamics, you're going to need a biomolecular simulation package. So these come. They are packages because they've got multiple things inside them. So a biomolecular simulation package has basically got three things inside it. Firstly, it's got an energy function. It's got one of those sets of equations, that maths, which describes how the energy depends on where all the atoms are. Secondly, typically, it comes with a pre-cooked, uh, uh, sorted out for you already, library of parameters which are appropriate for what we call standard molecular systems. In other words, if you want to do a simulation which is just on a straight ordinary protein or a bit of DNA or RNA in a membrane maybe, the chances are that everything you need to describe that system has already been worked out for you. There's a library of parameters and, oh, I gotta, gotta fight the monsoon now. Can you hear me all right? I can hardly hear myself, but is it all right? Okay, good. Um, 
Yeah, so you'll get the library parameters, and then obviously you'll get the piece of software which is actually going to perform the molecular dynamics simulation for you. So molecular dynamics was born in probably the late 1970s. I think it's sometime around there. And the, the granddaddies or grandmothers of them all, of all these molecular, biomolecular simulation packages are, are three, three of them. Amber, Gromax, and Charm. They all basically came into being at approximately the same time. I said about the late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, Amber and Charm from different, two different groups in the US. Gromax was a, a European initiative. And each of them basically contains these three things. An energy function, library of parameters, and the actual software to run your simulation. Now, what's interesting is that all three of these things, these codes, despite the fact they all contain the same contents, were entirely incompatible with each other. They worked in different ways, they used different energy functions, had different parameters, nothing similar at all. So what that means really is that communities grew up around each of these codes and were very, very sort of proud of their particular codes and basically believed theirs was better than anybody else's. And typically, if you joined a biomolecular simulation group in those days, you would basically have to fly the flag of one of these three codes, and that would be what you were stuck with basically for all your, your career. Because once you'd learned one, it was really difficult to learn another one. And they didn't work with each other anyway. But things have changed since then. Now there are a whole load of other biomolecular simulation packages around as well. Uh, I've just put an, the names of a few of the ones which are more common, but there are plenty of other ones as well. What's interesting about these newer ones is they're different from the originals in that typically they don't have a complete package. They don't provide a particular energy function and they don't provide this their own pre-cooked library of parameters, all they are doing is providing alternatives for the software that actually runs the molecular dynamic simulations. So, for example, NAMD traditionally used the energy function and parameters from CHARM. Um, the others often could use different ones. Um, I can't remember what who MD does now. But in fact, nowadays, for example, OpenMM, quite a recent one, that will be able, you can run simulations in OpenMM using energy functions from Amber or Charm. Um, Gromax, maybe as well. Actually, the, the Gromax sort of functions and, and parameters are slightly less used nowadays than they used to, with, with one exception I'll talk about later. Um, so there's now much greater interoperability between these codes. There's a much greater variety of codes that you could choose for your particular biomolecular simulation problem. Which one should I use? If you're a complete beginner, you think, well, like, which computer language should I learn or something like that? And really, there's no obvious answer to that. It very much depends on the sort of problem you're dealing with. Um, but for instance, um, AMBER tends to be quite popular with people who are doing simulations that involve small molecule ligands. Because the problem with typical small molecules is that they, their parameters are not available to start with. You've got to work out what they are. And AMBER happens to come with a whole load of and sort of helper programs that make it quite easy to find that the missing parameters if you've got a non-standard part of your simulation system. Um, but then if you're, you're interested in membrane proteins, then you might well be tempted to move in the direction of Gromax because there's an awful lot of literature. A lot of the very early simulations of membrane proteins were done by groups that use Gromax. And again, there are some tools and techniques and prior art, if you like, that's a little bit Gromax specific that can be used to run membrane simulations. I mean, you can run membrane simulations in Amber, or Charm or any of these other programs, but it's just, you know, where, where the history is. So when you are, if you are starting off from, from scratch with biomolecular simulation, it's certainly something to think about, about which of these packages is probably going to be the most useful or make your life easiest. <laughs>
It shouldn't matter that much nowadays. There's much more interoperability between them than there used to be. So let's talk then about a typical biomolecular simulation workflow, what you would actually have to do to get a biomolecular simulation running. The first thing, as I said before, is do a lot of thinking because uh, you really need to think, what is it that I could possibly get out of this simulation that's going to be useful to me? What is it that I don't know that I think a simulation might tell me? As I said right at the beginning, the kind of sort of fishing trips where you just basically, well, let's just run a simulation and see what happens. I'm sure something interesting will happen, and we can then, then we'll talk about it and analyze it further. It's a it, it's very, very dangerous thing to do. If you don't know what you're looking for, it's very difficult. So to begin with, obviously, if you're going to run a biomolecular simulation, you need a, a biomolecule to do your simulation on. Um, now, I first gave a version of this talk uh, only a couple of years ago, actually. And I said, you know, typically, of course, if you're a sort of coming from the world of biology, you think, well, I'll, I've got this protein that I'm interested in. I know what its sequence is. So um, I'll just basically, that's what I mean, that's what I want to study. So I'm just going to take my sequence and then I just want to know what the three-dimensional structure is. And I always used to say to people, well, you can't do that, can you? Uh, and then, of course, AlphaFold came along and then suddenly people said, well, no, but you can do it. Uh, and I thought about dating this slide, but then I decided not to because actually it's not quite true. I mean, AlphaFold is a brilliant thing but whether or not it's really capable of producing predictions of protein structures which are of sufficient quality to start biomolecular simulations, I just think is an unknown quantity and, and is probably sometimes true and sometimes not true. Um, one thing that people sometimes hope is that, well, even if my prediction from, say, AlphaFold is, isn't brilliant, Surely the great thing about molecular dynamics and all those force fields and things like that is that they'll, they'll fix it. And I always say that, you know, MD molecular dynamics is not like MD a doctor. If you've got a poorly protein, then MD will not fix it. It will not make it better. It will almost certainly make it worse. So uh, this idea of using simulations to clean up and fix bad starting structures, if you like, is nearly always, uh, you're, you're a loser from the start. Don't do it, don't try it, it won't work. You need a high quality three-dimensional structure for your starting point. So you're right, sometimes AlphaFold can generate those, but why is it that AlphaFold sometimes get it right? Because typically, like everybody else, it's using existing information, most of which comes from places like the Protein Data Bank. So if the protein data bank has got your protein of interest in it or a very close homolog, I'm not going to go into homology modeling, but I guess many of you will know about that. You've got a way basically of generating, finding or generating a starting structure for your simulations. Uh, but that's generally what you're going to have to do. So unless you're working just with small molecules, you know, small chemical species, where you can predict their structures from, from zero, you need to have some existing three-dimensional structure, be that crystal structure, NMR structure, or cryo-M structure, to, to start things from. So... The first thing that will happen when you get that structure is that it will not be ready for use. So, for example, if it came from a crystal structure, it won't have any hydrogen atoms in it. And that's fine for the crystallographers. They don't care about that. But you as a biomolecular simulator most certainly do. Biomolecular simulation programs will not like it if your system isn't atomically perfect with everything that, it ought, to, that ought to be there. So that might certainly going to mean if it came from a crystal structure, adding in all the hydrogens. And they say that's fairly easy. It's all, you can guess where a hydrogen is. It, that's, that's no trouble. But actually, it's not always that straightforward. Um, sometimes a crystal structure is, <laughs> pardon me, is 
missing whole side chains because they couldn't be seen in the electron density, or whole loops are missing because they were just too mobile. You know, the crystallographers have just missed them out of the structure, but you can't miss them out if you're trying to do a molecular dynamics simulation. You've got to put these things back in again. You've got to make your molecule whole again. Sometimes it's the other way around. To help them crystallize their molecule, the crystallographers have done all sorts of weird molecular biology tricks on it. They've done certainly site direct, introduced site-directed mutations into it to stabilize it, maybe. Sometimes they graft entire ex extraneous proteins into the middle of your one, you know, uh, IL-2 domains, or stick maltose binding protein on the end, or something like that. Things that make it crystallize in a nicely, obviously important for them, but it means that what you've actually downloaded from the protein data bank is nothing like the biologically relevant molecule. And all that information is always there, deep in the bowels of that protein data bank structure and the information that's available to you. But you've got to go looking for it. It doesn't necessarily shout at you. And if you're in a hurry and don't know what you're doing, it's quite easy to discover halfway down the line that you've done a simulation on something which is actually not really the biological molecule you thought it was after all. So one has to be a bit careful about the data that you get and how to remediate it. Anyway, when you have done that, there's still going to be stuff missing. Because, of course, what you download from the PDB never has a sort of environment in it. Uh, you want to simulate your molecule in a biologically relevant environment, which is either going to be in some kind of cytosolic fluid, or maybe it's a, oh, come back. Maybe it's a membrane-bound protein, in which case you want it embedded in a lipid bilayer. Now, these things typically are not present in the data that you've downloaded from your data source. So you've got to actually model ab initio from scratch some kind of realistic environment to immerse your biomolecule in so that when you do the simulations, they're going to be realistic and relevant. So there's a whole kind of modeling process to be done there. Now, finally, what you've done at this stage is you've actually generated the system, the system which is relevant to this, what you want to study. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this thing here. You'll notice that the bit that you're probably interested in is that little bit in the middle there. That's your protein. You can see it's surrounded by an awful lot of water here. Those are all atoms whose forces and motions you're going to have to be calculating in your MD simulation. This is why I said this thing that about a, a million atoms might sound like a lot. But the trouble is, is those million atoms that you simulate very often are, can be up to 90% water, which is not the bit often that you're interested in. So it's rather annoying, actually, that you may be spending 90% of your time or your computer's time doing calculations, doing sums that relate to a part of this, your system that you're really going to throw away, you're not interested in it. But you have to do that, because if you don't take the water environment or water and membrane environment into account, your protein or whatever else it might be is not going to behave properly. But that's why I feel like that million atom limit is sometimes quite annoying, because that's million atoms in total, not a million atoms of your substance of particular interest. Anyway, once you've got your completed system, then you're basically going to turn it into, if you like, machine-readable format, ready for your biomolecular simulation program. This is the process of finding all the parameters that are needed to describe it. For every bond in this system here, how long should it be? What's its value of R? And how strong should the bond be? What's that value of the force constant? What should the bendiness of the angles be? What should the electrostatic interactions between positive and negatively parts of the molecule be? So as we said, thousands and thousands and thousands of parameters that you need to find. Fortunately, all the biomolecular simulation packages have ancillary programs that help you basically with that process. But that's the next stage. So at that point, you then have a set of files, machine-readable files, ready for your simulation and finally you get to do what you're actually wanting to do run md oh at last after all that we're finally in the business of doing it
Uh, and yeah, off you go. This is where you might need your high performance computing system or your cloud or whatever it might be. And you run and run. And as we said, we want very long simulations probably. So we're going to um, be running for a long time, waiting for the data to come. And we are gonna generate a lot of data. So if you think about it, well, I won't do the sums, but it's not difficult to imagine to generate a lot of data. So what you do is you, what you're going to do is every so often, not every time, not every femtosecond, not every time you go around that loop, but maybe every picosecond, so about every thousand times you go around that analysis loop, you're going to basically take the current coordinates, the X, Y, and Z coordinates of your atoms, and you're basically going to save them into a file. And then you're going to do another thousand steps. And then again, the computer will save the new set of coordinates to the file. And each of those is one of your snapshots. So, you know, in an animation, that you know, they're images, you've got one after the other. So in a molecular dynamics, what you're generating is sets of coordinates, one after the other. And this file, which contains these sets of coordinates, is what we call a trajectory file. So that's a term you'll see a lot. <laughs> So that's all the trajectory file is. It's just sets of coordinates at defined time intervals. But that can be a big number. It's not at all hard to get to a situation where your trajectory file has got maybe 10 billion numbers in it. That's the sort of size of data that you'll generate quite straightforwardly. So that then brings you to the next bit which is you've got to make sense, some sense of those 10 billion numbers. <clears throat> and that's again where the, the human brain comes back in because there's never one obvious straightforward way to do that. That is gonna depend entirely on what the experimental design was at the beginning, what you were looking for in the simulation, what you expected to see, what aspects of those 10 billion numbers might be relevant to you and what you're going to do with them. But this part and it often is often the part which takes the longest. We may think it took a long, long time to run the simulations, but very often the analysis of the data that comes out of them takes far longer than running them. <clears throat> okay. So, how do we do it? Yeah. The actual running of the molecular dynamics simulations, it might be the most compute intensive part, it's certainly the least brain intensive part of the process. But there's a massive amount of brain power and care and attention that needs to be put in either side of that. Otherwise, it's true with molecular dynamics, as is true of pretty much anything you do with computers, that is rubbish in, rubbish out. If you haven't got things right at the beginning, you're wasting your time. Yeah, the most important challenging parts are going to be the, the design of the experiments at the beginning and analyzing these vast amounts of data that they can easily produce. And then there's also a question of actually how you store and look after this data, but that's a question for another time. Okay, um, as a sort of sketch, thumbnail sketch of biomolecular simulation, that's, that's really all I wanted to say. Um, What's the take home message? Um, yeah, so molecular simulations can do something that, that currently there's really no other way of doing. And it's this thing about making these connections between physics and chemistry, fundamental principles, and the way that biology works. There's no other method that can make the link really between these two. And that's important because most of us are in the business of trying to influence biology, but to a large extent, we can't influence biology directly. We influence biology by doing chemistry or maybe a bit of physics. So we, we have to understand how manipulating matter at the atomic scale through chemistry has the possibility of changing the behavior of a biological system. And molecular dynamic simulations is a massively powerful way to try and make those links and to make the predictions particularly about what's gonna work. I mean, the great thing is computers and algorithms just get more and more powerful. 
what this means is that things that you just thought you couldn't do a few years ago, suddenly the next day, oh yeah, they're easy. Let's say so alpha fold is, is a nice example. Okay, maybe with, there's a bit of hype there, but you know, it's true, the, the change is, it is a paradigm shift. And these things keep happening. So it's a really exciting thing to be doing because there's always the possibility that what was impossible has just become possible. But it's definitely not a quick fix. It's, it's hard work. And if you want to be good at it, it's no different from being good at being a bench chemist or a bench biologist. It takes time and training and thought and, um, yeah, attention to detail. And I think... That's it from me. Yeah. Um, what should we do now? We... Yeah, any questions? Of course, yes, absolutely. Any questions? Yeah, back there. Well, every single little sort of move, movement you could see there was one picosecond. So I think there were about, I think if I remember correctly, there's about two or three hundred frames in that movie. It was it was um, it was looping, but the the time interval between those frames was I think one picosecond. Yeah. That. Yes, it is. It's ten to the minus twelve seconds. Yes, a millionth of a thank you, a millionth of a microsecond. Not long. Break time.